As you know, in our series through Mark's Gospel, we've been talking about Jesus as the ultimate action hero. And every superhero has a secret to their great strength. For uh, the Green Lantern, for instance, it was this special ring that he put on that allowed him to do incredible feats and create things out of nothing. And most superheroes also had a secret vulnerability. For Superman, it was kryptonite that would, it was the only thing that could, could make him pause in his superhuman activities. Now, of course, these are just stories, comic book legends. But in every good story about good triumphing over evil, it's an echo of the greatest story ever told and one that is absolutely true, and that is the story of the ultimate action hero, Jesus Christ. There was a secret to Jesus' ability to do anything that he wanted. We're going to talk about that this morning. But there was also a hidden vulnerability in the Lord that caused him, that moved him to do things and behave in ways that were contrary to expected behavior. We're going to talk about that as well. Because those two things, that secret to strength and that hidden vulnerability are actually vital to the character of the Lord and our ability to be used of the Lord as well. Now, in the previous verses, the scene was at Peter's house in Capernaum on the northern shores of the Sea of Galilee. And if you remember from last time, Jesus came in and discovered that Peter's mother-in-law was sick with a fever. And Jesus healed her, and she was so overjoyed that she began to serve them. And the word got out very quickly that this man, Jesus, was capable of doing things they had never experienced before. You have to understand that there were no ERs, there was no 911, there were not even any doctors or nurses. Medical science was non-existent. And yet disease was rampant. There's a feeling that Peter's mother-in-law might have suffered from malaria, which was common in that particular area. There were many other things that happened to people, paralysis, parasites, diseases, viruses, bacteria, all kinds of things that debilitated them without the hope of anyone helping them in any way. In addition to that, and partly because of the fact that Jesus Christ, the ultimate action hero, had come upon planet Earth, there was an increased activity among the dark forces. In a way, it kind of reminds me of the lead up to a volcanic blast. As we now know, in the, in the years and months and weeks and days leading up to the eruption of a volcano or a major earthquake, there are little rumblings here and there. They build up more and more and more as the pressure builds. And so too, as the pressure toward Jesus going to the cross to die for the sins of humanity came closer, the forces of darkness began to be aroused. And they were anxious. And they went about doing harm because that's what they do in their very nature. And so people found themselves possessed by these creatures who would do nothing but want to, to do harm to them and violence. And um, here these poor people were just helplessly held in bondage. So Jesus came along the, on the scene and he freed them. Jesus came upon the scene and he healed them of their sicknesses. And so as we saw as sunset after sunset there in Capernaum, the word had gotten out. Everybody was on their uh, Android phones and they were texting each other and, and, and suddenly everybody appeared. No, it was, it was like household to household. One person would run to the next and that was a pretty effective network in those days. It was sort of Capernaum's version of the internet. <laughs> and people came from miles around and they gathered at the house. And it says that Jesus went up, went out from the house there, and he healed all those who were brought to him. But interestingly, in verse 34, it says he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And as we saw when Jesus was in a synagogue earlier in the chapter, a, a demon had tried to call Jesus out 
We know who you are. And so Jesus said, you know, I know you know who I am. These people don't yet know and they don't understand. And because it's not my time for them to know, you are going to shut up. And they went, mm. So then I'm sure after those events had taken place, imagine yourself one of the disciples. You have witnessed things that nobody has ever seen before. And then the crowds have all been healed. They've dissipated. It's pitch black. Everybody kind of goes inside. Everybody heads to their sleeping place, wherever that was, the mat on the floor in the spare bedroom, falling asleep, exhausted and yet exhilarated at the same time with visions of people being freed for maybe the first time in their life running through their heads. So then, very interestingly, we see what Jesus does in response to this incredible, incredible time. Look at verse 35. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he got up, went out, and made his way to a deserted place. And he was praying there. Now, very early in the morning, literally means the third watch of the night, which is 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. in the morning. It's quite possible that nobody in the house really got to bed much until sometime during the second watch in the night. So it, it's possible that Jesus actually, as everybody dispersed to their sleeping mats, he went out the door. And nobody knew about it. He just snuck out. Everybody thought Jesus had gone to bed. It wasn't that Jesus was unhappy with the accommodations. He wanted a sleep number bed, and they just didn't have one available there. <laughs> he wanted to check into the, the uh, Marriott at C Capernaum there. No, nothing like that at all. Jesus had something more important to do than sleep. It says that he got up, went out, and made his way to a deserted place, and he was praying there. And we don't know what he prayed, but Mark is pretty, pretty specific about his actions leading up to that. He got up, went out, and made his way to a deserted place. Jesus removed himself from other distractions and from other relationships and other duties so that he could concentrate on his relationship with the Father. I think it's probably safe to assume, based on what we see in the, in the following verses, that Jesus was praying for direction. Now, as we'll see in a moment, the demands of urgent ministry were about to be pitted against the strategic plan of the Father. Now, Mark records only three occasions of Jesus praying. Here in chapter 1, again in chapter 6, right after feeding the 5,000, and then the third time was before his arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now in these first two instances that Mark records of Jesus praying, huge success in public ministry had just taken place. And both here and in chapter 6, Jesus prays, and then heads off in a completely different direction rather than follow up on the success that just had just taken place. This kind of behavior runs completely counter to what every success guru would tell you that you were supposed to do. But this kind of thing of going back, building on the success that he had had the night before, may have been for Jesus a shortcut to fashion a popular movement instead of to become a savior. But Jesus was not about popularity. He was not about doing what the things that others had demanded him to do. Jesus was about one thing and one thing only, and that was fulfilling the Father's mission for his life. So I think for us, just from this first verse, the lesson is very, very simple and yet very vital to our lives, and that's 
for us to get up, get out, and get praying for strategic direction for our lives from the Father. And, oddly enough, especially when you are having success in your life as a Christian. Because the dangers that we face when we are successful is that we begin to manage instead of God. Because God often will do things and take us places in ways that are counterintuitive to what we as humans would do. So our question, number one, is do we take the time to seek the heart of God to reset our GPS to take us in a different direction? Kind of throw it open. We, Things happen and, and we, we have success and we think, wow, this is really great. This must be where God is taking me. And yet here, the logical thing would have been for Jesus to have stayed in Capernaum knowing that more crowds were going to come. This was the beginning of a movement. He could capitalize on what's known as the network effect, and that is success breeds success. And he could have had himself a movement right there and then. But he left. Not only did he leave, he disappeared. Look at verse 36. Simon and his companions went searching for him. And they found him and said, everyone's looking for you. You can just hear the, the bit of edge in their voice, can't you? Jesus, where were you? Scolding him just slightly. And he said to them, I like this. He doesn't really, you notice how Jesus never really responds directly to a question sometimes? He, he doesn't answer them. Where were you? Everyone's looking for you. And he says, let's go. Let's go on to the neighboring villages so that I may preach there too. This is why I have come. So we went into all of Galilee preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. So it really seems plausible based upon the response that everyone's looking for you, that when the disciples woke up in the morning and they went out to get their, their oatmeal or their gruel or whatever it was that they were eating that morning, I could just picture Peter, you know, standing at the, at the window. He's, he's got the Jerusalem Post in one hand and he's got his, his cup of Starbucks and his, his oatmeal and he's just <laughs> glancing out the window. And then he just kind of looks down the street and then there's just this line of people all the way down. Don't you think that's probably what the response would be? Don't you think that when those people who got healed went home, they couldn't sleep either? We've got to go tell Uncle Joe he's had this paralysis. He can get healed. This is real stuff. And so, if they thought the crowds were big the last night, the demands of urgent ministry. So, the disciples were kind of panicked, I think. We better get Jesus up. He's the man of the hour. Maybe they were thinking, this is really cool, guys. Let's go. Where's Jesus? I, I sent you to get him. Well, he's not, he's not where, where I saw him last. Well, you go find him. Where? You know, they take a roll call, roll call in the house there, and Jesus isn't there. So they go out looking for him. And, and I can just picture the, the guys, they start walking you know, down the street. No, he's not there. No, he's not down at Starbucks. Where did the guy go? And they still, so they're, they're, they're doing their fields, their grid search, you know, and they're going out wider. And they finally go outside of town and, hey, look over there by that rock. Does that look, guy look familiar out there? It's Jesus. Where's that guy been? We've been looking for him. And so they go out. Where were you? Everyone's looking for you. Why'd you run off where there was, when there was work to do, they say. But Jesus says just the opposite. Not, okay, let's go back. You're right. There's a lot to do. I'm sorry I was neglecting my ministry responsibilities. No, he just says, let's move on. And right now. In fact, the phrase, let's go on, or, uh, it could actually suggest that Jesus was already on his way out of town and was just waiting for the disciples to find him so he could continue. Returning to bask in the accolades of the healings that had taken place would seem completely logical, but it was the completely wrong thing to do. And that's something that you and I will struggle with as well. 
And again, the question that we must ask ourselves in prayer to God is, what will bring you glory from my life today and into the future? And in this case, the thing that would bring the Father's, Father greatest glory was to have the Son continue to preach the gospel of the good news of the coming of the kingdom of God. Because short-term healing without salvation is meaningless. Now that probably, that statement probably right there runs counter to a lot of what you've probably heard even in Christian circles. There's a lot of focus on healing. Healing's a great thing, don't get me wrong. But healing is only a short-term solution. If there is no long-term healing of the soul, then it's meaningless. It's not an excuse to, to, to withdraw help from those who are hurting at all. But at some point, we've got to keep the gospel in mind. So instead of fixating on the short-term successes, Jesus refocuses on his core ministry, and he heads out to preach the kingdom of God. In this 60 by 30 mile section of Israel known as Galilee. There was a lot to, to, there were a lot of places to go. 250 towns were spread out in this particular uh, area of Israel. But notice, as Jesus goes, it says in verse 39, preaching and driving out demons. He's preaching the gospel, but wherever he encounters the enemy, our ultimate action hero throws the enemy out. But just one event threatens Jesus' plan of action. Let's take a look at verse 40. Then a man with a serious skin disease came to him and on his knees begged him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched him. I am willing, he told him, be made clean. Immediately the disease left him and he was healed. Wow, what a story. The King James Version, if you're reading in that one, it identifies the man as a leper. That's actually the Greek word that's used there. The word means scaly. And it was used in New Testament times and Old Testament times for that matter for a whole host of incurable, serious skin diseases. So that's why the Holman translates the word leper as one who has a serious skin condition, a serious skin disease. Some of these diseases were quite contagious. Uh, the, the main one that we think of is Hodgkin's disease. Is that, uh, is that the right name for it? Yeah, leprosy? No? Zach, what is it? Um, I don't know. Okay, it's leprosy. Uh, <laughs> um, and that one can be contagious in some forms. And it's a degenerative nerve disease. Uh, it's the, the, they have like a leper colony, uh, I think in Hawaii, where they would take people. And um, it, it's a really serious thing. Uh, there are treatments for it, but um, in those days, of course, there was no medical science whatsoever. And there were whole chapters in the law dealing with the identification of these serious skin diseases and then the isolation of those who had been found to have them. Really, I think just anecdotally, just from my own readings of the Old Testament, I think that probably more pages are, are uh, devoted to this than any other single thing in terms of identifying something and then um, the consequences of that thing. Very, very serious. These people were frightened to death of leprosy. When someone was found to have leprosy, they would be isolated socially and religiously. They had to move into a colony outside of their village where they could have no contact with anyone except their fellow lepers. They were prohibited from any religious expression in the nation. They couldn't come to the temple. They couldn't do anything. In fact, they were so isolated that there are stories of when people who without leprosy 
saw lepers in their vicinity, they would literally pick up rocks and throw them at the lepers to make them keep a distance. That's how frightened they were. But look what happens here. This leper, this guy, comes to Jesus, okay, he's approaching Jesus. Jesus isn't picking up stones, he's just watching this guy come up. I just picture the disciples backing away quickly. And it says that he fell down on his knees and he begged Jesus, if you are willing, you can make me clean. What an incredible statement. First of all, the guy heard, obviously, that Jesus could heal the sick. He could have come with the kind of attitude like, you think this guy was sick? Look at me. Look at all that's happened in my life. Look at the isolation that I've suffered. Look at this disease that is eating me away. And, and that is just a horrible thing to imagine. So he might have come to Jesus and said, I deserve to be healed more than any of these other people. You need to heal me right now. But he doesn't. He gets on his knees humbly and he says, if you are willing. So first of all, he comes humbly. Secondly, he says, you can make me clean. So he comes faithfully. He is trusting in the source of healing that he knows. You can make me clean. And then I love what happens in verse 41. Look what it says there. Moved with compassion. Jesus looked down on this man. He didn't react like all the other Israelites would have. Stay away from me. Unclean. Unclean. Jesus looked at him and was moved. The word, the Greek word there, to be moved with compassion, it literally means to be moved as to one's bowels. Now the reason that they put it that way was because the, the bowels were thought to be the seat of love and pity. So Jesus looked on this man, he knew the suffering of the disease that it had wrought on his life, and his, look at his response, he was moved with compassion he reached out his hand and touched him. Don't go by that. You would never do that to a leper. I don't know how long this man had had leprosy, but I will tell you this, it's very likely one of the things that he missed the very most was the touch of human contact. Science tells us that if untouched by humans, newborn babies will die. That's how vital the touch of human contact is to us. But the one thing you couldn't do to a leper was touch them. And yet here's Jesus, moved with compassion, reaches out his hand. I'm sure the guy was thinking, uh, uh, no, no, you can't touch me. And Jesus touches him. And then he says, I am willing. And at that instant, Mark says, using another one of his action words, immediately the disease left him and he was healed. Can you imagine for just one second what that would be like? A man with no hope, in complete isolation, withdrawn from humanity, from his family, from his business, from his God, and from all human contact, falls down and begs last chance hope. If this guy can't do it, nobody can do it. And he says, if you please, please heal me. If you're willing, you can do it. And then to feel that touch of human contact on his skin, and then he's completely healed and whole. One of the reasons that I like this story so much is not just because of the fact of a leper being healed, which is incredible and wonderful, but it's what it also stands for. Leprosy in the Bible oftentimes is a euphemism for sin. 
And sin, like leprosy, is very contagious. It's incurable. And it is degenerative. It also leads to isolation, especially isolation from God. The scriptures tell us, my, uh, my, my arm is not short that I cannot save, my ear is not heavy that I cannot hear, but your sins have separated you from your God. Those things that we have done in the brokenness of our fallen human nature have created a gulf between us and our relationship with God. We cannot span that gulf. We cannot hope to be able on our own to return to fellowship with God. And yet the Lord, moved with compassion, reaches His hand down into the uncleanness of our sin as we humbly come before Him and we say, You are it. I have no other hope. If you are willing, please make me clean. And He says, I am willing. Be clean. And He reaches down in His cleanness to touch our uncleanness. And normally what would happen is the clean thing would become unclean. But only in Jesus, <clears throat> the unclean thing that he touches becomes clean through the blood of the cross. <clears throat> wow. So then, Jesus sternly warned him in verse 43 and sent him away at once, telling him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go and show yourself to the priests and offer what Moses prescribed for your cleansing, as a testimony to them. <clears throat> now Jesus did this quite often. Perform an incredible miracle and by the way, don't tell anybody about it. Okay, sure Jesus, no problem. And we find out in a second that the guy couldn't keep his mouth shut, which I don't blame him really. But Jesus instead tells this guy, now don't go around telling everybody about this, but instead go to the priests and perform uh, and offer what Moses prescribed for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Well, what in the world is this about? Actually, <laughs> this is the coolest part of the whole deal. Nobody got healed from leprosy. And yet, in Leviticus chapter 14, there's a whole section of the law devoted to what you do when you get healed from leprosy. Excuse me, <coughs> if it's an incurable disease, why do you have anything in there about what happens when there's a cure? Because of what happened right here. And what's really awesome is that offering that Jesus spoke about. Let me just read you the section out of Leviticus 14. It's very short, this portion of it. <coughs> the person who's been healed from leprosy is supposed to come before the priest. Uh, actually, it says that the priest shall go out of the camp and the priest shall examine him. And indeed, if the leprosy is healed in the leper, then the priest shall command to take for him who is to be cleansed two living and clean birds, cedar wood, scarlet, and hyssop. And the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. As for the living bird, he shall take it, the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssop, and dip them and the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. And he shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed from the leprosy and shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bird loose in an open field. Now I know y'all can probably catch the symbolism of this pretty easily. Who do you think the two birds represent? Us and the one who is to be sacrificed for our cleansing. Two living birds one of them loses its life and the other bird is dipped in its blood and then it's taken and let loose in an open field, free. Wow. 
That's exactly what happens to you and I. Jesus, as one of those clean birds, gave up His life, shed His blood, so that then when we are dipped in that blood, we are cleansed from the leprosy of sin, and then we are set free. We are free. Absolutely astounding. So then, as I mentioned, verse 45, there's no evidence that this man ever did that. Would have been cool, but we don't have an account of that. But here's what we do have. Verse 45, yet he went out and began to proclaim it widely and to spread the news with the result that Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but he was out in deserted places and they would come to him from everywhere. This guy became quite the evangelist, spreading the news about this incredible healing so effectively that when Jesus would come near to a town, and remember, they didn't uh, have buses or bikes or motorcycles or cars or anything. They were walking, you know. So I'm sure that people would run from one town to the next. Jesus is coming your way and the whole town would gather together. So there was just no way for Jesus to be able to enter into those little villages. And so he would stay out of town and the people would have to come out to him. Now, I want to conclude by just giving us two things to remember as we walk away from this, looking at just this little slice of what took place in the ministry of Jesus. And, and, and the first is really to stay in communication with God. Asking him, what's my part today in your great plan for eternity? And then being open to moving in whatever direction the Lord might take you in, even if it runs counter to what you might logically think. Well, Lord, I had success over here, so obviously this is where I'm supposed to go. I've said this often. Um, the presence of an open door does not give you permission to enter it. A lot of times, I think even us as Christians, we, we say, Lord, give me an open door. And, and, we, and it's based on Scripture. Uh, Paul said, you know, I have an effective open, or an open door for effective ministry. But we, we take that and we think any open door means that's the one I'm supposed to go in. I would want us to step up just a little bit more in our maturity. Even as Jesus, clear, huge, giant, this was no open door. This was an open chasm for ministry. People in need demands of his disciples, doing God's work. Where was Jesus? Communing with the Father, asking for strategic direction. Lord, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? I am presented with what might seem like the logical place to go based upon human expectation. But Lord, where do you want me to go? And the Lord said, I want you to walk away Wow, what I do wrong? Nothing. So be open to that strategic direction, even if it means walking away from human expectation or human demands. Only walk through the open doors that God says, that's the door for you to walk in. So the beauty of that is, maybe the door is closed, but it's still the one the Lord wants you to walk through. If we only went by the open door policy, we'd miss a lot. So you pray, I've got all these doors in front of me, all these opportunities, all these things that I could be doing. Lord, which way is it that you want me to go? What will, I, what will I do today that will bring you glory? What you might do today is simply pray that that closed door would be open and nothing more. And yet that's still how God wants to get glory out of your life. The second thing is as you are moving in those ways and God has set before you a direction and you're going, okay, this is the way that I'm going. As you are going, also then be open to not the human demands and expectations, but the godly characteristics that he builds into your life to move you, even if it means, uh, it looks like it's a, it's a, a, a side road. And, and I, I just get that from, from verse 41 where it says, moved with compassion. You know, 
Jesus said, let's move on, got to preach the gospel, not going to do any healings today, not going to throw out anybody from, you know, I gotta, I'm got. i moving on, I'm going in the direction, God's, God's glory, you know, God's mission. And yet he's going along and he sees someone who's hurting, and there may have been others, but he was, Jesus was open to a godly characteristic of compassion, and he was moved. He stopped. He didn't continue on with the mission that he had at that moment because his mission became this person at that, point, at that moment. And sometimes in your life, counter to human expectation, you might be called to stop. God's given you compassion on the life of somebody and everybody else is going, come on, let's move on, let's go on. We've got things to do, places to go, people to see, ministry to accomplish, and you're going, no. God wants me to just focus on this one person here. That might mean... I'm going to take a break from something because I need to spend some time nurturing a relationship with somebody who's been broken. And everybody's going, your time could be so much more efficiently spent. Well, maybe. So be in constant communion with God for that strategic direction and yet constantly open to God for His movement in your life toward reaching out into the lives of other people. Okay? Let's pray. Father, uh, I pray for each one of us, myself completely included, Lord, that you would make, us, uh, make our lives one of prayer. And, and corporate prayer, yes, wonderful, needed, but Lord, also personal communion with you. Taking time to just talk, listen, argue even, but ask. Direct us, Lord. Shape us, mold us, move us so that we in our everyday activities can be moving in concert with your eternal plan of salvation. But Lord, also in that, I pray that you would give us that heart of compassion that Jesus had so that we can reach out, be your hands, be your feet, be your healing power in the lives of others to bring them into your kingdom. We thank you for this. We pray these things for the glory and in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.